Welcome everyone to today's Tama Talk, brought to you by the Torrance Art Museum Advocates. I'm Janine Madden, current Tama president, and I'd like to thank you for tuning in. Today's talk will feature work currently on view at the museum from the exhibition Quadrant in the main gallery. If you're planning on a trip to Torrance or you are local, um, please, I highly recommend you take some time to stop in and see the show before it closes on March 12th. Um, I had an opportunity to, to see it when I was in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago, and it was just absolutely fantastic. Um, my favorite piece is going to be talked about today, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, the hours for TAM uh, for the Torrance Art Museum are Tuesday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., and the admission is free, although donations are accepted and gratefully appreciated. You can find the TAM on the web at www.torrenceartmuseum.com. The discussion today will be recorded, is being recorded, and will be posted to our YouTube channel with all of our other previous TAMA talks. And I will go ahead and put that link um, into the chat for anybody who wants to check out the previous talks we've had. I also want to make sure the chat is functioning for everybody. Um, and you can also get it from our website at www.tamadvocates.com. Joining us today is Lisa Rockford, an independent curator, artist, and educator, a passionate arts advocate. Lisa is celebrated for creating new opportunities for underrepresented artists, organizing multidisciplinary exhibitions, public lectures, artist workshops, and interactive experiences, all designed to be accessible to a broad audience. In 2013, she was dubbed a rising star in Gold Coast Magazine's article 40 Under 40 and has been named an agent, a change agent in local press for her community building events, art events. Over the past 12 years, Lisa has built working relationships with over 400 artists and has curated 25 exhibitions. She holds a Master's of Fine Arts from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and is currently a tenured associate professor of visual arts at Broward College. In 2014, she received the Robert Elmore International Exchange Award through the Honors Department to travel to China and the A. Hugh Adams Endowed Teaching Chair in 2018. Thank you so much for joining us today, Lisa. Well, thank you for having me. It's an honor. We are thrilled that you're here, and we're really excited to hear about your experience, uh, experiencing, experience curating Out of Bounds at the Torrance Art Museum. So I'm going to slide to the next slide. Um, this, is the, this is the card that shows uh, what the exhibition is all about, and the artist, and the date. And as I mentioned, it's going to close on March 12th, so hopefully you'll have an opportunity to get into the museum to see it before it does. I'm just going to read the card. Um, After being sequestered in isolation and living through a plethora of cultural, racial, and political dichotomies, the Quadrant Exhibition is opening at the threshold of a post-pandemic era. Out of Bounds is therefore a curated negotiation of physical and psychological space. The remnants of enclaves, architectural elements, and ineffectual boundaries are at play. Their architectural footprints simultaneously act as boundaries from, but not barriers to, the other quadrants in the shared exhibition space. The work emblematically depicts the destabilization of infrastructure to address themes of decolonization, segregation, economic disparity, migration, and marginalization. Please, um, Lisa, if you would share with us how this idea was conceived and tell us a little bit about the artists who you chose to be in the show, um, we would love that. I'm going to let you, do you want to share your screen? Yes. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. All right, everything, you see the full screen now? 
uh, in just a sec. I, I don't see an image yet, just the... sharing pause let me click on it again um uh, let me try that one more time sorry about okay that. okay there you go about perfect that's right. excellent yep <laughs> okay so um this exhibit is something I actually had the theme. Um, oh, did it go away again? I'm sorry. Uh, it just slid to the right a little. I might just need to slide. There you go. Oh, it was a little glitchy on my end, but it's okay. Um, You're good. <laughs> so this exhibit is uh, something that I, the theme is something that I actually thought about doing a while ago. Um, back in uh, 2015, uh, it actually. Um, was an idea I had when uh, the idea of a wall became kind of a, a divisive political symbol um, during a presidential campaign. Um, so, I, I'm sorry, I don't know why it keeps, uh, I'll, I'll keep my mouse off the screen so it doesn't keep flipping over like that. Um, so, Back in 2015, when a certain candidate promised to build a border wall between the US and Mexico, the wall soon became a symbol of division. And I started pinning artworks by artists that represented walls, fences, barriers, and the like. A lot of them which had been created around that time or recently. Uh, and that seems to be a popular theme in artwork today where artists are thinking about this idea of barriers or boundary markers, enclaves, um, and so that board now has 195 artworks pinned to it, and I'm continuing to add to it. So this theme is something that I could continue expanding on. Uh, and when I submitted the proposal to Torrance, um, the theme also started to embrace um, this idea of how we've had physical distancing during the pandemic. Um, so this idea of walls or boundaries is something that can definitely be symbolic to talk about many topics. Uh, so the artworks that I selected really have a wide variety of themes, um, but it's set up so that the works are very close together, <laughs> more than in the other exhibits in the show. Um, so there's really just enough space to move between the pieces and so that the pieces are, are really, you know, in close proximity to each other, in conversation with each other. Um, and so, really you have this kind of architectural uh, formations throughout the space, um, both indoor and outdoor markers. Um, so, sorry, I think it's because of my, my magic mouse. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta stop, stop swiping, I guess. Let me, let me try switching my mouse. No um, worries. It's very psychedelic right now. Okay, are you, you're not seeing it full screen right now, are you? Um, it is a kind of an image that looks like maybe two images, one on top of each other. Yeah, I think, all right. There you go. <laughs> so the first artwork that I'm talking about is by um, Neri Gabriel Lemus. Um, and this aligns the closest to the original inspiration for the exhibit. Lemus ex examines the politics of difference and representation, probing issues of immigration and racial profiling with an emphasis on African American and Latin communities in his native Los Angeles. Um, and I want to note that all the different um, things I'll say about the works are taken from a variety of sources from um, art critics, artist statements, as well as my own interpretation. So it's kind of a combination of, of things. Um, so these sculptures are from a body of work inspired by the sonnet, The New Colossus, composed by Emma Lazarus in 1883 and engraved on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. The most familiar couplet is, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. More inspirational, more personal inspirations behind the work are his experiences growing up in Los Angeles with parents that are Guatemalan immigrants and his firsthand experiences with prejudice, stereotyping, and feeling separate from society's mainstream. Correspondingly, he addresses the struggle that immigrants face while journeying to this country and after arriving here. 
The ceramic tablets share the narratives of immigrants that came to the U.S. seeking a better life for their children. The posts and have the colors of the flag from their home country and the signs serve as markers of com completion. They are titled Tetelestai, which is the Greek word for it is finished. In case you can't read the text, I'll read this one for you. My parents and family migrated from Venezuela in 98. Leaving their home wasn't easy, but it was necessary. They did it and with much sacrifice. That's what the life of an immigrant is, a lot of hard work. Immigrants work hard and long. They love this country and they're oftentimes fleeing from something because they too want a better life. RD are the initials. Um, this one, it represents someone from Mexico. It reads, my father was a brochero. I He suffered a lot. He was far from his family in Mexico, but convinced a good religious man to build a home for his family and brought his family home to the US. Years later, my mother cleaned other people's homes and ironed other people's clothes. I stand proud every day because of them. I am proud to be an immigrant, GC. Lemus has stated my work explores issues around race and family, not in the narrow sense, but in a broader sense that is ultimately about society's role or even responsibility to advance human dignity. My art frequently attempts to identify parallels within cultures and question the divisions people have. I am interested in creating art that not only functions within the context of the white box, but involves society or functions in a public context. Um, so just past his work is uh, artwork, two artworks by Ashley Hagen. Um, both the works in this photo are by the same artist. Uh, so I'll talk about them individually, but overall play is integral to her process as she investigates metaphors of home and self, fantasy and reality. Her work delves into the underlying resonance of childhood, the limitless inventiveness mystery imagination, adventure, and possibility. And I just want to mention if anybody ends up with a question, you can put in the chat because I have that window open in case um, you want to ask something before I move on to another piece. Uh, industrial and utilitarian materials are combined with objects like toys that hold the nostalgia of a more innocent time. These works are directly linked to personal memories of her own childhood. The colorful brick-like parts imitate both a Rubik's cube and shipping containers. A personal inspiration is that Ashley's favorite book as a child was Boxcar Children, in which orphan children were creative with an empty space of an abandoned boxcar and turned it into their playhouse. On the top of the work is what looks like the foundations of a floor plan. And uh, there's a hole here that you can look inside of. Uh, Ashley said that her parents built houses that her and her siblings would play on the construction site. And the foundation was the most fascinating part to her. A foundation is also a starting point and new homes offer promises of a bright future and of safety. Where Ashley grew up in the Midwest, it was common to have a basement, uh, which she says can lead to many possibilities for discovery. So uh, when you look inside of the hole um, in the foundation, you can see a light at the bottom of the cavity filled with toys, including another house. So that was, that's the photo I took on my phone to try to, to, try to capture what looking inside of the, the piece. Ashley says that her two passions as a kid growing up were making art and decorating her dollhouse. So this next piece actually uses a dollhouse uh, as part of the um, construction of it. Um, this work was originally inspired by an episode from the Twilight Zone. And the sculpture is intentionally absurd in a state of transformation. Uh, so in the original episode uh, that she was inspired by that stuck with her, um, you know, this kind of visual uh, analogy, uh, there was a family that woke up um, kind of being covered in some kind of oozing uh, material. And eventually at the end of the episode, you come to find out that they are people inside of a house uh, that's actually a dollhouse of, of someone else's house. 
Um, and so there's this kind of surreal idea of a house within a house. Um, so this work is intentionally staged at Toddler's Pipe. Uh, and each view offers a different persona for the anthropomorphized dollhouse. It's simultaneously a figure with child-sized legs and a protective shell or smoke limply hovering. Um, and this is one of the pieces I saw people kind of looking at the most in the, in the exhibit. My uh, favorite piece. Really, <laughs> <laughs> including you, right, Janine? Yes, absolutely. Fascinating. Uh, and it partly, probably because there's, it looks a little different from each view. Uh, so on the reverse side, a uh, lava-like substance has erupted forth and the silver color creates a further alchemic departure from the original plastic fabric and foam materials uh, where the vulnerability of the materials are masked with a metallic-like armor preserved as a relic of memory. Uh, so here you see that again in the corner of the space. Um, so we're looking kind of from the corner of that exhibit at a work by Tanya Brodsky uh, made of vertical blinds and vinyl prints. And uh, this piece is two-sided, so there's a different image on each side that I'll show you in a minute. Um, so the found image on each side, one, one side, uh, which you can probably tell, is an exterior view of a dense forest in British Columbia. And Tanya didn't take this photograph herself. She actually used the stock images. <laughs> so they're uh, like royalty free images that are used for things like advertisements. Um, this one is from the exterior view as if you're immersed in the outdoors. Um, and when you're on the other side of the piece, it's an interior view uh, with an idyllic landscape in the distance. Um, the images being stock photos are more they're printed larger and more grandiose than you would normally see them in something like an advertisement or used on a website. Um, so they're larger than intended to be seen and and lifted up uh, to be something, you know, um, different than they were meant for originally. They're at eye level and in your face. Uh, and this one specifically, uh, this image I think humorously harkens back to the Vanitas tradition of creating a still life in painting uh, that goes back, especially the Dutch masters, um, where they would use ephemeral objects to reference mortality. In this case, the pile of raw meat hinting at the excess of wealth. The installation subverts our relationship to nature, alluding to a contemporary distancing from actual physical experiences with nature and the artifice of synthetic replacements for the real experience of going outdoors. I'll read a portion of Tanya's artist statement, uh, which is very conceptual. <laughs> the inability to communicate clearly can be described as feeling walled in. The buildings we construct act as containers for bodies, and in them we learn where to tiptoe, when to slam doors, what to throw out the window, how much the neighbors can hear, dot, dot, dot. Kaiser Permanente sends me generic stock photos accompanied by recommendations for something called forest bathing. In a blur of communication and advertising, image and text are flattened, co-opted, coded, recoded, and ultimately digested, leaving behind traces of mutated half meanings. The eye's focus oscillates between looking through and looking at, a scattering of sight and attention, a breaking apart of the singular. When I saw an ad stating that the bare paint color of the year is a green hue called Back to Nature, all I could think was, dang, the 90s really are back. <laughs> um, so I pulled up a photo referencing what she's talking about, that this is an actual thing. It's kind of a gross color in my opinion, but this idea of going back to nature uh, as a title for the, for the interior uh, where you're separated from nature. Um, so right uh, past that work, we have a piece by uh, Daniel Bocado, which is staged kind of like it is outdoors. Um, and this is another work that ties in with the American consumer lifestyle. Um, reminiscent of a garden ornament or gatekeeper statue, the cast concrete lion sits vigilantly on top of a salvaged air conditioner. 
Lion sculptures are familiar decor placed in front of many properties and institutions, so they offer latent symbolism and many cultural associations. The tradition of lion sculptures originated in China during the Han Dynasty as early as 208 BCE, connected to beliefs of Buddhism. A pair of lions are thought to protect the building from harmful spiritual influences and dangerous people. They originally stood in front of powerful institutions like Chinese imperial palaces, imperial tombs, government offices, temples, and the homes of government officials and the wealthy, and made out of expensive materials like carved marble or cast bronze. They're still pervasive as protective decor today, even if the belief system may not still be attached. While in China, they're said to bring peace and prosperity, in Italy, the lion sculptures are meant to symbolize power and prestige. And in Quebec, homeowners traditionally place one or two lions in front of their house once the mortgage is paid off. The work is also a representation of the American consumer lifestyle where more meaningful connections have been lost in translation and cheap copies in cement are mass produced for the American market. An ad from statues.com reads, purchase our grand sitting lion garden sculpture is sweeping grandeur of Italian estates is yours when you welcome the sophisticated architectural drama of our large lion statue to your home or garden. Proudly seated with a regal, powerfully muscular icon will lend quiet strength and courage whether flanking an entryway or standing sentinel near a garden gate. Unparalleled as classical art our enviable quality cast stone is a wonderful sculpture, is a study in affordable elegance. And you can see the grammar's not great there, but I don't know what um, country the, uh, the, the company comes from. But uh, on the left, you can see Elvis Presley's home where he bought um, uh, some marble lion statues from a home that he uh, had seen. He bought them from another home. Uh, and then on the right is a woman that decorates her uh, lion statues for all different holidays in, in Virginia. Um, so there's something that is definitely connected to America. Um, and in this case, the air conditioner is a remnant of consumerism and the comfort of a privileged lifestyle sought for as part of the American dream. The lion now looks like he's protectively hoarding or guarding his possessions in a contemporary wasteland. Um, and this is from a series where uh, Boccato has cast several <laughs> lions uh, from a mold and combined them with other um, consumer objects or items of architecture um, where they look like guarded property. I curated the sculpture to sit next to what looks like the ruins of a home by Karen Lofgren. Uh, working from a feminist and decolonial perspective and deeply influenced by diverse counter countercultural environments in which Lofgren came of age, her process and research centered work taps into personal, social, and cultural anxieties regarding mortality and time, value, gender, power, privilege, and infrastructure. Titled Envy the Ocean, uh, it invokes, evokes a shadowy zone between creation and destruction. The seemingly abandoned structure may look burnt to its foundation or it is simultaneously a survivor rising from the ashes with defensive pikes. Uh, and here you can see it exhibited in another show, a solo show that she had where you can see another view of it. Um, the four independent structures that create the architectural footprint are covered in black volcanic sand. Upon closer inspection, you'll notice the glass eyes watching, watchfully following viewers in the space. And that little cricket was one that joined the piece during the opening, so that's not part of the work. <laughs> <laughs> that was an ephemeral moment of performance on the cricket's part. Um, Suggesting both organic growth and ur urban decay, the work acts as kind of a border implicating the viewer in a subdivision of the gallery space. One sense of being inside or outside of the sculpture mirrors an internal tension between the animate and the inanimate. If Envy the Ocean implies kind of a stage, it's also an audience. 
fluctuating between who or what is performing. And uh, between those pieces on the horizon of the exhibition's geography is a work by Anne Libby that alludes to architecture in the distance. The work is from a series of depictions of glass modernist building facades transforming glass and steel into quilted and padded polyester. They waver as if in heat, softening the strictness of the grid and creating an image that looks almost ephemeral. The surface material is a retro reflective fabric, which has the ability to return a maximum of light and is used for nighttime security gear. The surface appears brightest to an observer located near the original light source, for instance, a car's headlights. So it's a material that's not typically used for, <laughs> for quilting. Uh, Libby used the fabric to cover an inner padding to a mimetic effect. The upper is taut, slightly wrinkled, which adds to the destabilizing mirage-like effect. As a wall piece, the work merges illusionistic space with sculpture. Retro reflection imitates reflection and balancing between representation and abstraction. The work on the edge of the, the exhibit is also by Karen Lofgren, who created the, um, the house-like black piece. Uh, so this borders most of the, of this, the section that I curated. It's titled No True North uh, from a body of work that offers an exchange of physical and psychic energies by employing conductive or insulating materials like copper and wool felt while exploring pleasure, sacred geometry and boundaries. The 12 part installation traverses the wall and the floor of the gallery exploring directional boundaries, lost and absent limbs, insulating and conducting. It creates a barrier or border and maps a flow of energy. While it depicts an industrial line usually found on a road, it remains organic in material and shape. So that's a uh, copper leaf, which, you know, the tradition of gold leaf goes back to uh, the Renaissance or before, but um, this is a copper leaf instead of gold leaf. The artwork forms a boundary line to most of this curated section, partitioning the out of bounds exhibition from the rest of quadrant. Spaced enough for the viewer to step between or over draws attention to the work's materiality, as well as the bodies of the viewers in the space, while suggesting an alternate world where the compass is broken and there might be no way back. So her works both are really activated by the viewer walking around them or in, you know, between them. Um, it's very much about the physical space of the viewer with the piece. And from this camera angle, we're looking from behind a blue barrier, which is the work of Brody Albert right behind or next to Karen Lofgren's work. Brody Albert's work addresses the objects that shape and are shaped by social interaction uh, on a similar note. Uh, he sets out to manipulate implicit behavior and expected codes of conduct. Familiar and banal, viewers will be forgiven for thinking the modular sculptures are ready-made, used to seeing them in both highly politicized and depoliticized spaces. But why are these stanchions inside a gallery? Albert is interested in malleability, how quotidian objects can work the same function at the same time in different contextual scenarios. The stanchion's embedded politic as an institutional wayfinding device adopts different modes in a theater or a museum to that at border control. The commonality is unnerving. Albert reconstructs the power dynamics of these loaded communal spaces by creating an aesthetic experience within the gallery's architecture itself a space of shifting guises. These stanchions are 42 inches tall, scaled up by 15% to reach above the hip, the hip. We possess a body memory to interact with these unassuming objects, and so the performance begins. It is not enough for the sculptures to engage with the gallery's architectural 
space alone, but the viewer continues to activate the work. The most surprising aspect is that these trompe replicas are made of industrially dyed MDF composite. Even the latches and retractable belts are made from this single material. The works, the work are an extraordinary example of craftsmanship of something otherwise manufactured um, that appears to be, the hand of the artist appears to be invisible. Its conflict of function is also reflected in the fabrication because MDF is a cheap fiberboard, like basically compressed paper, um, material commonly found in mass-produced furniture. It's a vulnerable material, now given gravitas and elevated simply by being used in a contemporary artwork. So identical are his renderings that his hand gesture is totally effaced. The subject of the stanchions symbolize power and control, but in actuality, these are weak and vulnerable to the touch. Uh, above the stanchions is a work by Scott Froschauer. Um, let me check if he... Uh, He's here, yep. He's here, great. Yep. Okay. So we're fortunate to have uh, him with us today that we'll get to hear a little more about his work uh, from him. Uh, in, counter in counterbalance to the more bleak or fatalistic themes in the exhibit, Froschauer's work is more optimistic in intent. Uh, so I'll show you some of his works and then I'll um, have him talk more extensively about them. Uh, but to introduce him, uh, Scott received a BA in theoretical linguistics from Syracuse University which undoubtedly influences his use of positive messages and language in his work. He utilizes a practice called culture jamming, which uses familiar elements from the urban environment to make a social critique. Um, and you can see he exhibits his work both indoors and outdoors. Uh, this is the other piece that is in the show with a photo of it shown outdoors. Um, and you can see it on the right side of the, of the work here. So his works kind of bring us full circle to both ends of the exhibit. Um, so Scott, if you can turn your mic on. Hi. Hi, how are you? Terrific. So I'm glad you could be with us here today. Um, so can you tell us about how your works have multiple meanings or why you utilize signs as a medium? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, one of the things to consider is, um, for instance, the, the notion of um, optimism is, uh, I'm, I'm really looking for um, immediacy and um, how, to, how to convey um, presence and so, for instance, in the piece, um, all we have is now, all we ever had is now, it's not necessarily um, optimistic as much as, as it is, um, it's attempting to be grounding. And what I'm really looking at is what are the, um, what are the mechanisms that are, that are at play in our environment constantly? So street signs are uh, quotidian, you know, they're, they're every day, they're, um, things that become invisible in the landscape um, that we just uh, we allow to just pass by us, but they're very potent uh, tools. The color, the fonts, the shape, um, all of these things work at a subconscious level on us. So, like a stop sign, for instance, is a perfect example. You don't even know have to you don't have to know how to drive to respond to the red octagon shape. You know. Uh, a, a 10 year old sees a red octagon and already knows that that means stop. And when you're driving, you don't have to actually focus on the stop sign. Your foot would just reflexively go to the brake pedal. So th these shapes and colors and fonts are working on us at a reflexive and subconscious level. So what I'm looking at is tapping into those tools and if I'm going to use those tools, what am I going to use those tools for? And the idea for me is um, self-empathy, um, uh, com self-compassion, and immediacy are the are the the goals, you know. And then the 
the mechanism is this uh, subversion of traditional uh, signage, which, you know, might be surprising to someone. Um, you know, they might see the sign and expect it to say one thing when it says something else. They have a, a moment of surprise. And it's in that that opening up of that surprise that I have this this opportunity to inject some message. So, you know, what is that message I'm going to send? And it's, you know, it's about compassion and empathy and, and immediacy and presence. Yeah, and these are very universal symbols too, like across the globe, you could exhibit your work anywhere and it would translate, you know, across languages in that way as well. Um, I actually do um, several of my pieces I do in uh, multiple languages. So I, um, and then I'd use the interplay of those multiple languages next to each other. So I might do a, an installation that's in eight different languages that's exactly the same piece in eight languages and kind of, you know, show kind of the universality is what I think you're getting at. But that's exactly it. Um, yeah, so sorry, I don't even make that exit. I'm trying to, when I swipe my mouse, it accidentally exits out of there. Um, so do you often, I, I notice you often show your work outdoors as well. So is there kind of a percentage of whether you show it outdoors or indoors more often? Well, I think in that notion of um, surprise and kind of context for the work, I think it's most powerful when it is um, uh, quote unquote in the wild um, because it's even, it's less expected. When you're in a gallery space, I think that there's already, um, the viewers already tipped off to expect, um, you know, that something's going to be happening, that, you know, that, that this is, you know, that this is a, you know, a work of art. Um, when they're, when they're installed in, um, you know, in outdoor spaces in, um, in a park, for instance, or, um, you know, a pedestrian walkway, I think that's where, um, the work really, uh, has, is most potent because that's where someone, um, is surprised by it. Um, I, I think back to a collector of mine who, um, would go to a coffee shop every morning and get, get his coffee and he would sit down at the same table and drink his coffee. And right in front of him was an art gallery that had placed one of my uh, signs, you know, on their front lawn. And he would sit and drink his coffee every day. And he never read the sign because he had made the assumption that he knew what it said right. because of the shape and color. And he did that for a year. And he finally read it. And he said, oh, my God, that sign doesn't say what I thought it was going to say. And he walked over to the gallery and he bought the piece. But, wow. you know, in a gallery, you're going to stop and look. You know, if it's a, if it's a if it's in a museum show, you're going to stop and look and read it. And it's if it's out in the wild, you might just walk past it. And you know, if a if a large percentage of people don't even notice my work, that's part of the game that I play. Is that right. a small percentage will notice it, but it'll have a much higher impact on that small percentage who do. Yeah, and it. it I, I was going to say the same thing. I bet there's several people who miss the pieces who don't even know all the time their artworks <laughs> all the time all and the time in a gallery you have a whole different precedent because you you see it as a 2d work on a wall um but your work fits very much in the realm of, of street art in that way um so how did you feel uh with seeing your works in the uh exhibit about how they interacted with the other pieces um well i think it's i think it's really exciting i think the i think the the, the premise for the show is um, really exciting because they're, you know, um, a, a lot of the work uh, taking either ideas or, um, you know, physical objects that we're used to seeing in one, uh, you know, one format or one framing and um, disturbing that, uh, you know, that notion that we traditionally have with them, you know, ju just to even reflect on the, the, the piece you were just talking about, you know, um, that the, our, our, you know, that that work is even dealing with um, how the body interacts with those stanchions. That we have physicality, and that's kind of that's you know that that reflects very similarly to how I think about my work. That we have these subconscious ingrained reactions that are already pre-programmed into us, and what happens when we disturb those you know ingrained you know predispositions? You know that it's it's there's a short circuiting. That happens you know what what do we as artists what do we do with that short circuiting what do we what do we attempt to 
um, you know, what do we attempt to convey in that moment that of surprise, you know? And I think that's, yeah, I, th I thought my work fit in really well with um, the, other, the other artists. I thought it was fantastic. Great. Uh, well, and I, I'm glad to be able to work with you. And I, I should mention, uh, I, I haven't worked with any of the artists in the show before this, because um, I'm based in South Florida and um, the, the show is a focus on LA artists. So I was excited to be able to work with um, artists I haven't worked with before. So with all of them, it was kind of a cold call that I haven't you know, met any of you before. Um, so it was a whole different experience for curating for me. Um, so since we have uh, extra time, I'd love to hear from anyone in the audience. If you uh, first have a question for Scott um, or if you had any questions pop up about the show. And if your mic's not working, you can use, you can put something into the chat, but if anybody wants to pop in with a, a question or comment, feel free. So of course I have a gazillion questions, but I would love to hear from everybody else because <clears throat> Um, I, when, when Scott was talking about, uh, his pieces and again, there, that particular, um, all we have is now, I remember, uh, when I went to the museum to see that piece, I took a big picture of it because it's sort of my mantra, right? Like mm. I've been listening to a lot of Eckhart Tolle and his whole idea is that all you really have is now when you're thinking about the past, you're doing it right now. When you think about the future, you're doing it right now. And so um, it really resonated with me. But when you started, when he started talking, when Scott, when you were talking about um, that idea of putting up highway signs and the fact that we don't really, you know, we, we look at them when we need to get places, but so many of them are just subliminally cemented in our brains that we don't really pay as much attention to, to them as we should. It reminded me of, um, is it Ankrum, Richard Ankrum's work? I think in 2010, he, he replaced a freeway sign in LA and really nobody, he dressed up as a like DOT worker or something and no one really noticed it. And, um, and he, you know, and that's what it reminded me of, just this idea that the things that we see every single day can, uh, can change and, uh, and, we often don't, and we often don't notice them. Yeah, Max is saying, Richard Ankrum. Did we have something at his, I feel like we might have had something at his at the museum once, I can't remember. Maybe that's why it's in my brain. And it, it very much relates to like the statement carpe diem or seize the day, you know, the, this kind of philosophy. Um, so, it, right, it's partly optimistic, but it also is, is a reminder um, that, you know, like a memento mori or, you know, relating to the vanitas to like remind you of your mortality as well. So did you curate the whole show virtually? Yeah, exactly. All online. Um, so I basically was searching LA artists online. And this is before I submitted the proposal uh, because they had a call for curatorial proposals. And so you know, I wanted to have that all shaped to know who the artist would be and everything. Um, you know, that most of the, the people I had in the proposal ahead of time. Um, so, so right, how did I'm you everything from online? <laughs> that's great, though. So how did you? Um, and so two things, Scott, you unmuted. So do you have something you want? Do you have something that you'd like to? Uh, I was just going to comment on um, what you were um, that sign that went on the um, the 110. Um, it, I think there's another component, something in his work and in my work, because what specifically he was doing was he was um, modifying an existing sign with um, a piece of information that the public thought should be there, but that DOT hadn't put there. And when DOT ended up updating that sign years later, they actually incorporated his addition to the sign because it was a good idea and i what an interesting thing that comes from you know an overlap of his work and my work is this notion of whose voice does the sign speak with when you see a stop sign who 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 is the speaker of the word stop and it you know it's really you know some 
maybe designer, some DOT designer, some, you know, um, maybe a politician of, you know, something like that. Um, and what he was doing was he was, you know, utilizing the people's voice of this is what the people would like to see on this sign. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's an overlap with where I'm coming from is this, um, you know, signs are traditionally coercive, do not enter, no left turn, wrong way. You know, they're telling you, you know, they're coercing you into doing things. And so I'm trying to go with this level of inspiration. And so it's what would happen if, you know, if, if I got to say what was on the signs and he was kind of doing a similar sort of thing, what would happen if the public got to say what was on the signs? And so I think I, I was just going to comment on that, that I think there's an interesting overlap between what he was working on and what I was working on outside of the fact that it's just actual signage. Absolutely. Right, and the, and the yeah. Come from a, a voice of power or this like right. institution of power, right? And and your signs are kind of a, a more, you know, toward the directing it as a communal voice or, um, you know, in, in, inspirational voice as well. So Scott, Personal. I'm gonna I'm gonna have you stay on because or keep your uh, microphone unmuted because we do have a question for you in the chat which um, wants right. to know, how did you choose the aqua and white color scheme? Oh, well, that's, um, th those are actually um, DOT colors. So um, what, what I'm doing in the majority of my work, so you've got two pieces of mine in the show and one of them would be the DOT specification, the, the green one, and then there's the mirrored one. So the mirrored one is, you know, uh, is, is not, Department of Transportation spec. That's a um, architectural grade polished uh, stainless steel. So it's a um, a mirror that can go outside and withstand the elements. And then it's um, I sandblast in the details to etch that into it. So it's an outdoor capable uh, mirror. The green and white one is fabricated to Department of Transportation specification. So it's using um, 080 aircraft aluminum uh, sheeting for its uh, for the the basis of the of the panel and then it uh, uses a 3m uh, engineering grade reflective vinyl not unlike the material in um the woven piece that uh, reflects light um that's a that's a fabric that's a um a reflective fabric that's based on these tiny little microscopic spheres um which is the same thing that uh the vinyl in uh this piece is based on so um, it wasn't a, the choice is for the font, for the colors, for the shape, and for the materials is all um, dictated by the Department of Transportation. So I'm, um, I'm not, I'm making that choice to follow their guidelines. So that sign is, other than the actual words on it, it is to Department of Transportation specification. And I apologize, the color's a little off, especially here, it looks more aqua. So they're more, they, they look green in person. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, they are a bit sacrosanct too. You were saying about the stop sign. I recall being in San Diego a couple of years ago and somebody uh, yarn bombed a stop sign with a, um, with a green, piece of yarn and then they made it look like sunflowers and the city came mm -hmm. right over and took that down because you know again I think anything that sort of interfered with that powerful message to stop uh, was deemed uh, unsafe for the community so even though it looked really cool. Well and I think that's an interesting conversation between um, public art and street art because I do both I do um, I do public art and I do street art. Um, public art requires permits requires um a lot of time you know to to you know find locations that it's uh, able to be done in you know um it's just it's a long game street art you can decide you want to do it you just do it right then and there and you can do it anywhere you want it just won't last because right. the city's going to take it down but there's a, there's a tension between those two things and benefits to both absolutely Absolutely. Do all of the artists, um, all of the art, how did, how did you make, and I'm sorry if I already asked this, how did you make the selection of the artists that you chose? Did I ask that already? I'm so sorry. Uh, not exactly. Just to be more, more specific, I actually um, 
used artsy largely for uh, because you could search by city. <laughs> and so uh, since I didn't have as many artists contacts in um, LA, um, then uh, I, I relied a lot on, um, on artsy to find artists in LA. So um, sorry, I'll go back to this screen. I guess my internet's getting a little glitchy. Um, right. So I was really just searching different keywords and things, but I also had several of these artists um, on my Pinterest board um, that I've been, you know, kind of saving different artists working along the theme of, of these kind of barriers or partitions, um, you know, architectural elements. And there was no coordination with any of the other three um, curators in the show, correct? Or was correct. there? Correct. We all submitted separately. So, um, you know, it was, it was really nice the way they staged the different um, shows across from each other, because I thought uh, that uh, Joey's show across from my, they complement each other well. His was more, more black, the dark works at, based at night. Um, and then the, the pieces on the other side, you know, the, so right, each corner is a, is a different show within the gallery. Absolutely. Um, Joey was on last week and he, um, we were, I was asking him, so unlike the other two, uh, the other two artists, you also chose not to, uh, to include any of your own work in this particular show. Was that intentional? Yeah, I actually keep my curating and my artwork totally separate, um, you know, just kind of as different kind of separate roles or just separate careers. Uh, but it is, you know, a whole different type of like curatorial, um, you know, viewpoint. So I'm thinking of just more as like a, a curator from like more being inspired by a certain theme and um, kind of really selecting what works will go well with each other. And then um, the other three curators in the show, I believe are all artists, right? And and included their own work uh, in the show. So. Yeah, everybody but Joe, I don't think Joey, Joey chose not to um, also include okay. a piece of his in the show, but I'm pretty sure Carolyn and Kang both did. But d yeah, right, all four are artists. All four of us are yeah. artists though. Yes. So. <laughs> It is, it is all from an artist's curator standpoint. And, you know, in many museums, the curators are art historians, um, but I think artists do have the benefit of thinking visually, you know, so mine are very much, you know, like about visual uh, correlations with each other. Um, and I really enjoy doing a group show with the theme where you have several different perspectives on a theme, um, you know, as opposed to a tighter concentration of one aspect of a theme. But. And did you talk about that large um, black and white gray piece on the wall? Did you spotlight the, that? Yeah, the fabric one. Uh, um, oh, I see. Um, I might have gone through it quicker. The, uh, you're talking about the doors or the, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we can see the doors here. Um, so I, you can't see my, can you see, there. you probably can't see my because you're sharing your screen. Um, so just straight back um, on that large wall the to the right of the doors. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, I, I probably went a little too fast on that one. Um, but this one was by Ann Libby. Um, and her work is uh, really a, they're imitations of reflections in like glass buildings, like yes. modernist okay. buildings. So um it's, it's interesting is not everybody necessarily gets what the imagery is supposed to look like. I, I saw it pr pretty quickly because she has a whole series of these. Um, so some people just see them as an abstract work and then other people do kind of see the reference. Uh, but I think it might have to do with how much you've been around cities or skyscrapers or these kind of modernist buildings. Um, so if people are live in cities, they're very used to seeing that kind of thing. Um, but right, and that's what uh, Scott was also talking about, that she uses a fabric um, that is uh, retro reflective. So it's not um, it originally used for things like quilting. Uh, it's actually like for security um, clothing, like to, um, or like, for example, a bicyclist wearing it. So they're seen with headlights. Um, so it, the fabric reflection. is literally used for reflection <laughs> and she's portraying a reflection. So it's a really interesting combination of that. 
and it's very evocative of um, the piece in Joey's um, show of the building at night. Yeah. A, yeah, he also has like a skyscraper in, in like gray. So those were, you know, kind of diagonally across from each other. It was a nice uh, parallel with that. And Carolyn mentioned that too in her talk about how um, just serendipitously some of the works really complemented them, complemented each other really well. So, again, a very um, innovative, uh, cutting edge kind of uh, show at the Torrance Art Museum. We're just beyond lucky to have um, this kind of work in the city. And we are also just super happy that you were able to join us today and tell us a little bit about it. Um, there are folks who uh, haven't been able to come and see it and also you know hearing uh, about the pieces specifically from the curator uh, you know the Torrance Art Museum uh, docents uh, get the benefit of hearing Max talk about the work that's up um, during the year and from a curatorial aspect and so hearing it directly from you uh, working with all of those artists was very special for all of us today. So I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. Well, thank you. It was, it was really nice to be able to spend a little more time lingering on these works, even though I, I can't see them in person anymore because I'm back in Florida. Um, but right, is the show's only up for, I, I believe, a little over a week left, right? Yes, um, the 12th, that will close on the 12th. Yeah. So I hope more people are able to see it, but I'm glad that these talks also make it last, you know, online past the time the show's taken down as well. So that's great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have any last minute questions before we close out? Perfect timing. We have three minutes to spare. So thank you all so very much for attending today. And um, we look forward, like I said, this show will close. Studio Systems will open in... Oh gosh, Max, tell me, uh, April, end of March, waiting for him to text me in the chat. I know he said yeah, that. Thank you to Max for, uh, for coming up with the idea for this exhibit. And he's the one who kind of selected how these, which shows were put together. So. Absolutely. I mean, that is one of the other things that's very um, cool about the Torrance Art Museum is that these shows are planned out for, um, you know, time in advance. And uh, these kind of shows uh, where I think I'm trying, okay, Extraction, thank you, opens April. Oh, Extraction opens April 2nd. So, oh, that's right. Okay, so check the website. That's my mistake. Studio System, I think, comes later. But um, yes, this show will close. Show in the main gallery then? Yes, in the main gallery. Okay. And Studio Systems is in June. So lots coming up at the Art Museum. Um, we are hoping to get someone on board soon to help us with the with the social media piece. And so you'll start to see uh, information about the upcoming shows on both the website and um, Facebook and Insta and all the social platforms. So keep your eyes open for what's coming up at the Torrance Art Museum. All right, everyone. Thank you so very much. All right. Well, I hope to meet you in person at some point, and I look forward to seeing the next uh, Tama Talks. Well, thanks. Thanks again for coming out. Everyone have a great weekend. You too. Bye-bye now.